Welcome everybody to the UNSW LAT Information Evening. I'm Associate Professor Melanie Schwartz, the Deputy Dean here in the Faculty of Law and Justice. I'm very happy that you've joined us from across Australia and even across the world. This is a great opportunity to learn more about UNSW Law and Justice. We are ranked first in Sydney and 13th in the world. We're looking forward to answering your questions tonight about why and how you can come and study with us in 2024. I'm here today at our main Kensington campus and I acknowledge the Bidjigal people who are the traditional custodians of this land. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. This faculty is a leader in legal education and it is built on a commitment to excellence, intellectual ambition and the pursuit of social justice. We believe that our work should serve the needs of the local and global community, including those on which the law bears most harshly. This has been the mission of UNSW Law and Justice since its creation more than 50 years ago. At UNSW Law and Justice, we want our students to have the ability to demonstrate their aptitude for legal study, rather than exclusively relying on the ATAR for entry into law school. You will soon hear from Helen Gibbon, who is our wonderful undergraduate program director for the UNSW Bachelor of Laws. She'll tell you a little bit more about our LLB and the Law Admission Test, or the LAT. At the end of the presentation, you will join a live panel discussion with Helen and some of our current students. Please don't forget to submit your questions on the Q&A box to the right of your screen. Thank you again for joining us and I'll now hand over to Helen Gibbon, the Program Director for the LLB. I'm Helen Gibbon, the Program Director for the Bachelor of Laws, or the LLB, at UNSW Law and Justice. Today you'll hear from me about what your life will look like as a UNSW Bachelor of Laws student. But first, why study law? Law is such an interesting and important discipline. It affects each of us all day, every day. Law plays a key role in society. It affects us in our decisions, in our interactions, and, uh, and with other people in ways that you might not even be aware of. The law gives us rights, it protects our rights, and it guides citizens' behaviour. It's challenging, it's interesting, complex, and provides an exciting and rewarding career. Law opens up a whole range of opportunities, and working as a lawyer can mean many different things. As many imagine, working as a lawyer can involve clever courtroom tactics, closing multi-million dollar property deals, acting as the defence in high profile murder trials, advising on corporate takeovers, or prosecuting those accused of organised crime. More than that, working as a lawyer can involve everything from drafting a will, to drafting an international treaty, from conveying a studio apartment to conveying an office tower from advising on the purchase of the local corner store to working on a takeover by Google. It can involve acting for an individual who has lost their job. It can involve advising on the specific section of the Dividing Fences Act or developing policy regarding amendments to the constitution. The examples are infinite. Lawyers can be and are involved in every area of life. Studying law will also teach you how to think analytically, critically, precisely and carefully. Being able to solve problems, being able to see things from different perspectives, being able to argue persuasively, being able to present the best case. This is what we call thinking like a lawyer. But again, this can mean an extremely broad array of things. UNSW Law and Justice sees thinking like a lawyer to involve everything I just mentioned, but also to involve an understanding of society. Strict legal rules and rationales have their place, but they must be learned and used within the much broader context of the real world. 
UNSW Law and Justice was founded on the principles of law and justice and well grounded in well established legal skills. We are committed to social justice and to making a difference in this world and invite you to join us in this mission. At UNSW Law and Justice, all our undergraduate law degrees are offered as double degrees. Doing a double degree allows you to achieve more in less time and broaden your skills and opportunities. We offer 21 double degree law combinations, so you are sure to find one that is right for you and based on your passion and interests. There are students undertaking computer science, French, commerce, Japanese, criminology, psychology, and social work. And that diversity has always enriched our classroom. You may be wondering what makes law at UNSW special. Firstly, interactive, small seminar style teaching is very distinct to UNSW Law and Justice. We pioneered student focused interactive teaching in small classes in Australian legal education. Unlike the traditional large lecture and tutorial model, at UNSW we have between 35 and 45 students in each class. Our students do their legal readings before coming to class and then during class time we, um, students discuss the issues and the themes of the topics with their lecturers and their peers. It's highly interactive, dialogue based and an interesting way for our students to learn. Something else that is very distinctive to UNSW is our commitment to experiential learning. All of our students spend some time at our very own community legal centre, Kingsford Legal Centre, located here at the UNSW Law Building. You'll get to work on real cases with real clients while being supervised and learning from our in-house and volunteer solicitors. Experiential learning offers students the unique opportunity to simultaneously study the theory of law and in the classroom, and also to experience it in action. It plays a critical role in the process of transforming our law students into ethical, analytical, and engaged legal professionals. We offer a wide variety of clinics and internships, which you can do for course credit, so you will finish your degree as a highly sought after graduate. Students can also get involved in mooting competitions. Our students compete domestically and internationally. As a student at a top 15 global law school, you will learn from some of the country's leading scholars and professional legal practitioners, many of whom have shaped work towards shaping the legal landscape of Australia. At UNSW Law and Justice, our research consistently has the highest possible ranking under the Australian Government's Excellence in Research Ratings. If you're keen to add international experience and legal knowledge to your study program, UNSW Law and Justice also offers two to three week overseas electives. These courses are offered at a range of overseas locations during the main summer and winter term breaks. We also run short courses overseas in locations including New York and Berkeley in the United States, Santiago in Chile, Zurich in Switzerland and Shanghai in China, Pune in India and also Vanuatu. If you're looking for something a little longer, we also have exchange agreements with over 80 international partners spread across North and South America, Europe and Asia. UNSW students don't pay any additional tuition fees to the overseas host institution and your law courses overseas will be credited to your UNSW law double degree. Now I'm sure that most of you watching today will have heard about the law admission test or the LAT. Some of you may have sat the LAT last year while you were in year 11 and others will be planning to sit the LAT this year in September. The LAT is required for all domestic students who would like to be considered for admission to our Bachelor of Laws at UNSW. 
including students who are already studying law at another university and wish to transfer to UNSW. The LAT is a written test that is used to demonstrate your aptitude and suitability for studying undergraduate law at UNSW. The test has been developed in conjunction with the Australian Council for Educational Research, or ASA. When you sit the LAT, your results are valid for two years. And if you sit the LAT twice, for example, in year 11 and year 12, we only look at your best result. To apply to UNSW Bachelor of Laws, you must submit your UAC application and be sure to include your LAT registration number. The LAT is held once per year. So if you are looking to study law in 2024 and haven't sat the LAT last year, you'll need to sit the LAT this year. For more information on the LAT, you can also visit the UNSW Law and Justice website. For a variety of reasons, you may need to consider alternative entry pathways into a law double degree. Your chosen career goals could have changed at the last moment, or your ATAR and LAT score might not have been quite what you were hoping for. Whatever the reason, there are still pathways and options you should consider. Internal program transfer, also known as IPT, is a popular pathway into our law program for students who are studying non-law degrees at UNSW. We reserve up to 100 places every year for IPT students and we only look at your UNSW results, so ATAR and LAT don't count. IPT doesn't necessarily mean the degree will take longer to complete. UNSW Gateway is an admission pathway for students in years 11 and 12 attending Gateway schools or recognised as EAS eligible under socioeconomic indexes for areas consideration. Students who apply for double law through UNSW Gateway do not need to sit the LAT. Find out more on the UNSW Gateway website. UNSW Indigenous Pre-Law Program is an intensive residential preparatory course designed to assist First Nations students to develop the skills necessary to successfully complete studies in law. The program includes a simulation of the law school experience, an introduction to university life, assessment and legal thought. Program content includes an introduction to legal process, Aboriginal legal issues, criminal law, legal writing and academic skills. Find out more on the Noora Gilly website. There are three steps to apply to the UNSW Bachelor of Laws. Firstly, you need to register for the LAT. Applications are now open. Then you need to sit the LAT in September. And lastly, you need to submit your UAC application and be sure to include your LAT registration number. If you haven't submitted your questions yet, please do so using the Q&A section on the right hand side of the screen. We will shortly be joined by our panel members who will share their own experiences of UNSW Law and Justice and the LAT and answer any questions you may have.
Hi everyone, my name's Shanze. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'll be your host for this evening. Um, to start off with, I am a fourth year commerce and law student. I'm also co-president of the UNSW Law Society along with Matt, who we're joined with this evening. Um, I'll start by getting our lovely panelists to introduce themselves. So, Matt? Yep, so hi everyone, my name is Matt. Thank you so much for joining us again. But yeah, I'm a fourth year studying commerce and law as well. Um, and I'm also the other half of the co-presidency of the USW Law Society this year. Hi, uh, my name is Jess. I'm a final year commerce law student and I graduate in September. Hello again. <laughs> Hi. Um, when I'm not being the director of undergraduate studies, I also teach criminal law here in the law school. I've been uh, with the faculty since 2010. Um, as, as an academic, but I also did my law degree here. Amazing. Um, so thank you so much for sending through your questions um, and be sure to send in, keep sending them through th throughout the evening. Um, the first questions are direct to Jess and Matt. Um, could you start by telling us why you guys studied at, chose to study at UNSW and what you guys are studying? Yep. Uh, I'll you first. Yes, Matt. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so I chose to study, I, I, I currently study commerce and law, but I didn't start with commerce and law when I started at UNSW. Um, but I think I started, I chose to study at UNSW because um, my, both my parents are alumni of UNSW in varying capacities. Um, and, I, and I felt a very strong connection to UNSW even before I even uh, knew what the uni had to offer me because of that. Um, I heard so much about, uh, about all of that when I was growing up. Um, and then I guess I chose to study law because I did see the potential in, um, I guess, how, how People, even youth, can have a large impact on the way um, the world works and especially to the future. You know, the world is changing every single day um, and every person should have the opportunity to be able to participate in um, discord, uh, discourse and everything like that. Um, but yeah. Um, so I'm studying commerce law as well and I'm majoring in finance. So I started um, at UNSW the first year the lap was offered, so that's a number of years ago now. But I really chose UNSW because I really liked the vibe. I don't think there's a better way to describe it, but I yeah. really liked the way that I felt on campus, um, how the people were really warm, really welcoming. Um, I was always pretty determined to study law. So as Matt said, the, the opportunities at UNSW were another, were another factor that guided me to the UNSW program. But really the vibe and the opportunities that come out of the law school or a uh, the major reason I chose it um, and I started off with commerce law but I also added uh, about three or four subjects in Spanish as well which was really cool to have oh, that nice. flexibility so it's been a great time. Excellent. Yeah I definitely agree so I always knew that I wanted to do law as well but um, I didn't exactly know where until I attended the open day at UNSW and it's true the vibe mm -hmm. and the culture and the people around you um, it really makes a difference. Um, so our next question is about the law admissions test. So to study law at UNSW, you guys have been told um, you need to sit the LAT. What was your experience, Jess and Matt, with sitting the LAT? Um, was it difficult? Any advice that you'd offer students? So I turned up to the LAT not really knowing what to expect. I'd seen the practice paper that was available online. But other than that, I turned up just ready. I'd done my, my subjects at school and that was about it. So I didn't find that I needed any knowledge to do the to do the test. I found it was pretty self-explanatory when I got there. I just had to answer the question on the page. So I didn't I didn't find it easy, but I didn't find it challenging and like I needed to study. Have anything different, Matt? Yeah, for sure. Um, when I first sat the LAT along with Sean Zay, it was I think the last year where it was completely written. Um, we were sitting in a big um, it was near it was one of the race courses, yeah. And we we're all <laughs> sitting there and a bit nerve wracking because it's in the, in the in a big hall and lots of different people but you know, once you kind of sit down, you see, uh, the, I guess, the question on the page, you know, there isn't really much present preparation you need to do beforehand. I uh, definitely suggest to look at the practice paper before that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all, you've, you've, you've got it in you already, so just need to show them what, you, what you're capable of. Agreed. Um, Helen, is there anything that students can also do from your perspective? And if someone's sitting this um, lat who doesn't live in New South Wales, what can they do? Can they sit it online? Yes. Yes, it is. If you're not, if you can't make it to a testing centre, yes, you can sit it online. Um, I would just agree with the, the comments that have already been made that 
there's nothing you need to do between now and the lat, you know, to study hard for it or to prepare because it's the critical thinking skills and analysis skills that you've been taught in high school um, that is really what we're testing in the lat. And so there's, you already have the skills that, that, we are, that we are looking for and so you don't have to actually go and do extra, um, extra study. But otherwise, just registering and showing up and, and sitting the lat is all you need to do. Awesome. And on that, you mentioned that there's, they're testing your critical analysis mm. skills. Um, is there any other specific criteria that the lat is testing? students or that you guys might look for when marking the lat? Yeah. Oh, no, we don't mark the Yeah, we don't mark the lat. Um, ASA marks the lat. Yes, so critical thinking skills and your analysis skills, writing skills, so making sure you're writing clearly um, and concisely. You're limited by two hours, so there's, not, there's only so much you can write and, there, and there's two questions. But really, we're just looking for critical thinking, critical analysis, persuasive argument, um, and, and clear, clear writing. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be sort of complex legalese uh, dis arguments, just the plain English that you're, that you're already learning um, in high school. Awesome. And I'll continue on from that. So uh, students asked, um, are Year 11 students marked on the same scale as Year 12 students sitting the test? Yes. Yes. Okay. And what happens if students don't do so well in the lab? What options are available to them? Yeah, so I mean, this is what I say to all prospective students, it, whether I'm talking about the LAT or if I'm at open day. The LAT is only one, coming into law at UNSW, um, that the LAT is only one entry because, as I, as I said in my introduction, there's that other very popular entry, the internal program transfer. And so that's, and I always say that if you want to study law, if you are passionate about studying law, you will study law. So if, if your ATAR or your, and your LAT score are not what you had hoped and it wasn't a, an offer, then you can still apply to UNSW for the other half of the degree that you would have been interested. For example, commerce or criminal law. So, you know, I, I would use the example of criminology. Study for one year here at UNSW and then looking at your university results, you can then apply for um, an internal program transfer. And we have up to 100 places across the institution each year for IPT students. Wonderful, thank you. And I might pass on to the students. So um, do you mind telling us how you guys may have studied for the lab or do you even need to study for the lab? Just elaborate a little bit more on your experiences. So I didn't study for the lab apart from looking at the practice paper and writing yeah. a few dot points the night before. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't need anything more. I, I was successful at the time. So definitely don't think it's needed as yeah. long as you do like something like Helen said, and write clearly, concisely and in plain English, which is something that's a requirement of just high school, finishing high school, yeah. full stop. And remember a pen. Don't forget a pen. That's important. <laughs> ah, that's good advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, yeah, obviously have a look at the, the practice paper, but I think it's also very useful to talk to people who may have set that set the exam before you, um, not to obviously ask, uh, obviously to ask what kind of question to kind of expect, what kind of skills you might need to use to, to best answer the question, but also the kind of experience of being, I guess, uh, in that environment and writing um, something that isn't a high school exam, um, you, something that you probably wouldn't be too familiar with at that point. So, yeah, definitely talk to as many people as you can who have um, sat it um, before you. So. That's great. Um, and staying with the students, um, is there a double degree combo that you say would best match studying law with? And how does how do double degrees work? Yeah. So I don't think there's any one degree. I think there's over 20 combinations. 21. You can do with, 21, 21 degree, yeah. Um, that you can do with law. So it really just depends on what you're interested in and what you want to do in your career or what you've, what you've liked so far. Um, I did commerce and the way it worked for me when I started was I did six commerce subjects in my first year. I think it's five now. You do five non-law subjects and then you do two law subjects your first year. And then as you progressively move through, you, you do more and more law subjects until you get to eight in your final year. Um, but there is flexibility to move subjects around and do them later if you want to change your progression in some way. So have you finished your commerce degree already and then still got your, some law 
So left. I I finished my commerce degree in exchange at the yep. end of last year, and then I have one law subject to go. So you generally, with a, with a dual degree, would finish. It, is that what you've done as well? Finish getting through the other degree and then have electives yeah. left yeah. in law. Yeah. yeah. So it's very flexible. So okay. some students choose to finish commerce first and only have law left, and other students like to finish their law degree first and have their commerce subjects left. So uh-huh. I love my law degree. So I have been um, preferencing my law subjects more than my commerce subjects, although I love commerce as well. But it just means that I won't be finishing commerce first. I might be finishing it in the same um, last year of my degree. Yeah. That's really it's sort of a bit of a plug for the flexibility of yeah. the program. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And you get to do internships and stuff in certain subjects. So you can move your degree around and move your subjects around so that you can complete those internships or go on exchange or take a gap term, whatever it is that you want to do. Yeah. And there's really cool opportunities as well to either lighten your load. So mm. you can take two subjects a term, and which translates to six subjects a year. So you're still technically a full-time student, but you only have two subjects at a time. Or you can take full, full terms off if you want to do cross-institutional <coughs> study or... Um, if there's, they have a lot of programs overseas that are offered through yeah. the uni, so there's stacks of different ways to get involved and change the degree around a bit. Yeah. Yeah, and I think for me, uh, especially like, there's absolutely no right degree, double degree. Uh, I, I've been through two different double degrees before I ended up with commerce. Mm. Um, what were so, the other ones? So yeah, I, I started with um, media, screen, and sound production with law when I first started because I really enjoyed film in high school. Um, it was a subject I took then. Um, <laughs> And so I, I followed my passions, I followed my interests. And, um, you know, as I got into university, I, I learned and I grew. And um, obviously there was COVID and all those things, but I found what I, what I wanted to pursue um, as I got into university. So there's no, there's no way you need to know exactly what you're going to do when you come into university at all. Um, there's so much flexibility, as everyone said before. Um, and at the end of my second year, I changed to commerce. Um, and, I, and I love that as well. So you don't have to have all the answers when you first start. Um, Definitely university is the place to learn and grow and, and find what you're passionate about. Can I just add? Yeah. Yeah, choosing, choosing your other degree, um, my, my strong advice is obviously to choose something that you're really interested in, but also thinking if you already have an idea of the sort of law that you, I mean, you come into law school, don't you, you think, oh, yes, I want, to, I want to do this sort of law, and then by the end of it you're doing something completely different. But, for example, um, as Matt said you chose media studies, if if you were interested in using your law degree in a media career, what it films, whatever, that that other degree gives you the sort of the the double amount of knowledge. It's not that you'll never use that other even if you go as into practice, it's not like you'll never use that other information, um, the, the, the knowledge that you've got in that other degree. Uh, criminal law, if you're interested in, in pursuing a career in criminal law, then it would make sense to have your other degree to be doing criminology. So I would really sort of be thinking about not only what interests you, but sort of what you think you might be interested in um, to follow to follow your career. Because media studies, you know, really does lend itself with sort of IP law. Um, but having said that, you, you could well change your mind and that's fine and that's very normal. I was talking to a student the other day, she's doing commerce um, commerce law and she said oh I just really want to be a criminal lawyer now and I'm like that's fine you can still because you don't even need to change degrees yeah. when you get to your electives you can just start choosing the courses that that you're interested in everybody studies the same law core courses so you have that same foundational n- knowledge and then you will specialize your interests um, in the electives later later in the degree um, and while we're talking about our academics and our degree, um, Helen, how does the Socratic method um, <laughs> work? Yeah. And how is it different to having lectures um, yeah. at other institutions? I can tell you what it's not, and it's Legally Blonde, if you've seen that <laughs> that scene from Legally Blonde where the, where the professor is just peppering um, students with, with really tricky questions until she trips someone up. That is not what the Socratic method looks like. In Australia, that's that's a very American approach. Ours is more of a soft Socratic, so it's dialogue based. It's questions and answers, but it's more of a discussion than than somebody standing up the front and just and just asking questions and students. It, it's a, an all class discussion. It's it's sat, if you until you actually experience it, you might think, oh, that sounds really intimidating, but it's not. It's really relaxed, relaxed environment. Everybody sort of. 
well, most people feel fairly confident to sort of contribute f from early on in their program. Um, and it's the assumption is that everybody has come to class having prepared by doing the readings and then we kind of grapple with the big issues um, that, the, that the, the readings throw up. It gives you the opportunity to ask questions, challenge concepts um, and, and think about the themes in, in detail as opposed to a lecture tutorial model where the lecturer stands up, you might have a thousand people in the lecture and they're just transferring the, the information and you just sort of write it down. Mm -hmm. It's really very much what they call active listening, uh, active learning, um, where you're so engaged and just um, thinking about the issues and asking questions immediately. It's a, it's a very efficient way of learning and it's also very interesting. Yeah, and I think when you're transitioning from high school into university, it also makes it a very comfortable space because yeah. going from high school, you are asking questions, you're talking in class, you're, go you're involved in discussions. Um, and I thought going into university, I just have to listen and take in information. Um, but no, it's not like that. No. And, and it can be intimidating speaking and raising your hand up in the classroom and stuff. But so long as like you're all there to learn. Yeah. Everyone is asking questions. Everyone's thinking the same thing. So the more that you do it, the more comfortable and the more yeah. conversational it becomes. So, yeah, I agree. I just want to mm -hmm. underline that. Yeah. Everybody's a bit nervous when they yeah. first get to law school. They haven't sort of found their feet. Um, and you sort of think, oh, I don't want to say anything because I'm going to say the wrong thing and everyone's going to think I made a mistake or I'm going to... Everybody thinks that. Mm -hmm. I get We get our self-reflection, our CP, self class participation, self-reflection. They all they say, oh, I'm so nervous. Mm -hmm. But everybody feels the same. And it's actually such a really safe space. And I encourage you when you start law school to start your habit, good habits early. Mm -hmm. Staying on top of the readings will make you feel like you can participate. It's when you haven't had a chance to do the readings because everyone has busy lives, that you sort of think, oh, I don't want to say anything. I'm going to say something inconsistent with what, what was in the readings. But just trying a little bit, even if you're a shy person, just contributing a little bit each class, mm -hmm. um, setting goals, and it really does get so much easier with yeah. practice. Definitely. So much easier. Yeah. Um, while we're talking about how classroom is like, um, what makes a good law student, would you say? <laughs> um <clears throat> Someone who's very organised with their time, it's probably no secret that law school involves a lot of reading. Um, and so you have to be disciplined with your time to set yourself that space before class to, to, to do the readings. Because when you sort of miss, the, miss a few classes and then you start to come to class and you, you feel like you might become falling behind, it can then become quite overwhelming having to catch up. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, and so, and so being very organised, time management is key with law school. There's, you know, you've got readings not just for law, for your law courses but your other courses as well. Um, and then assessments sort of come around quite quickly and it's really important to plan, t plan space in your week for these are, the these are the hours that I will spend doing my readings, these are the hours that I'll spend working on my assessment and be disciplined. Don't just sort of think, oh, I'll, you know, I'll make it up tomorrow because then you'll have twice as much to do. Um, and relying on your friends, like really building good networks very early on is what will help get you through those tough early years where you're sort of finding your feet. Um, being open to opportunities. Law school is full of so many opportunities. And what else makes a good law student? Being um, sort of willing, sort of open with, coming, to, coming to law school with a really open mind and, and being willing to learn because there's just so much, there's so much new information to take in. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What do you guys think made a good law student before you started and now having gone through your degree, what do you think makes a good law student? I think most of my idea of law school was informed by Legally Blonde. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then the other part... There's no two hours, though, right? There's law no two school. hours. And I haven't seen anyone in a pink suit yet. I which have is pink leather suit, even. How good. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think that was really... I expected there'd be a lot of Latin, and I didn't study Latin at school, so I was like, oh, I'm going to need to learn Latin yeah. to study law, and there's going to be huge words I won't understand. But I think, if anything, everything's much simpler than I expected. And... Um, I found that the the assignments that always got the highest marks, the ones that they publish as examples, were always really simple, really plain yeah. English, really yeah. clear to read. So yeah. 
um, it really dispelled my legally blonde myth. Yeah, if someone... big ideas, not big words. Yeah. 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 yeah, of course. I think um, I still believe it's, it's someone who's, I guess, very p- persistent and always determined and always, um, you know, uh, as you said, like the best legal, uh, I guess, assessments are, are ones that are written simply, but also ones that have a lot of work in it that have gone through every single revision and they keep on revising it. And that starts with starting early, being organised. Um, but I think one thing that um, I definitely learned is that, you know, while you should always try to be as organised as possible, you can't always... That, sometimes that's not how the cookie crumbles, you know. <laughs> and it's okay sometimes to understand that, um, you know, um, to have a break and also to, um, you know, recover for yourself. Um, but, yeah, you don't have to be perfect all the time, but... Try, trying to be is also good as well. Yeah. You've got to be kind to yourself, yeah, I think, is really important. And in, in being organised, set aside space for the things that you actually enjoy doing, the, you know, whether it's exercise or hanging out with friends or whatever, rather than just sort of think, I'll oh, just sit here and study for another 12, 12 hours. Yeah. It's not yeah. a sprint, it's a marathon, so balance, yeah. balance is probably key. Um, so we've got some great questions coming in about the LATS. So firstly, whether a low LATS score will impact um, a student's ATAR. So um, the way that you're marked in entering into UNSW law is on a sliding scale with your LAT score and your um, ATAR. So the higher your ATAR, then um, the less pressure there is on your LAT score, whereas vice versa if it's the opposite. Um, so just think about that. A uh, low LAT score doesn't have a great impact, yeah. but you do have lots of other opportunities, like Helen was talking about, to enter into law um, from various different avenues should you not be successful through um, undergrad and the lab. Um, and also another great question is, um, what happens if you miss the lab test date? So we only have the one date, so you have to make sure that you do attend. However, um, there are exceptions um, if you are sick. So in extreme circumstances, you might be offered to have um, a catch up. Um, however, again, that's only in extreme circumstances and cases are based um, case by case in the circumstances. Um, So outside of that, we have a wonderful question about what actually is corporate law and what do people do if they're in corporate law? (laughs) I think that I had this question for the first two years of my degree and going into law as well. So it's a very, very good question. Would you like to take it, Helen? No, I think we'll leave it to the commerce students because I'm pure criminal law. (laughs) It's everything that's not criminal law. (laughs) Um, I worked in a, I've worked in a corporate a couple of different firms, one of which was corporate for a few years. And so I was in a disputes team. Um, a lot of it involved big companies. So there'd be big companies who need, in this case, something had gone wrong. So they needed someone to represent them. And then the solicitors um, where I worked were the ones who did all the preparatory material. So that's um, like as a paralegal, it was a lot of legal research. So researching different issues in contract, in private international law, um, sometimes in criminal law actually it came up. But um, so a lot of it was like legal research, preparing documents, doing the background work um, can involve document review, which is when you like you go through documents. But essentially, corporate law is just representing corporations. um, And it's probably the typical thing you think of when you think of Mm. like law firms, um, kind of like suits is the way it's represented on TV. But it's not really like that in real life. It's just people working to represent corporations. Mm-hmm. Anything to add? No, no covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that yeah. note, um, so you mentioned you had a job or have job. Um, did UNSW help with that? And if not, are there any ways that UNSW can help students with their careers? So I applied through a clerkship program. Um, they're really heavily advertised mm. at the law school. There's many ways that the law school help, law school helps you find different opportunities. There's a jobs board, there's careers fairs, there's posters everywhere. There's there's no way you're going to miss miss any jobs that are out there, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and then there are other, other programs that UNSW has. They have an array of programs in both, um, d- in different degrees. So in the law school, there are different um, practicums which you can do with the Kingsford Legal Centre. There's um, Feel free to jump in, guys, if you want. I was going to say, you're going to list off all our wonderful experiential learning. Uh, Yes. Can I, yeah. Yeah, Please jump in. Yeah. um, There's two two ways to answer that question, two different things I want to say. As I said in my introduction, that there's, we pride ourselves on our experiential learning program. And so we have a large number of internship opportunities and clinic opportunities. So, for example, 
Um, I take the police powers clinic. So I have six students, like it's a very small group, six students who come with me to Redfern Legal Centre um, for the term, working on real ca cases with real clients with the Redfern Legal um, uh, Centre solicitors. And so that experience that you gain at law school for credit, so that's, that's an elective, is fantastic experience to go into for when you leave um, and are applying for jobs and you can say, well, you know, when I was dealing with this difficult client um, at the Kingsford Legal Centre or in the Police Powers Clinic, this is how I handled it. It just really gives you these, you know, concrete illustrations of how you've already worked in the legal profession, albeit that you're still in a very safe environment, supervised um, at the law school. Um, so what else have we got? The Land and Environment Clinic um, internships. And you can organise your own internship. So, again, just in my area, sort of public defenders, legal aid, um, Aboriginal legal service. You can organize, it's, it's, You can go anywhere. We have a work integrated learning director who <laughs> helps our students um, finding interesting placements during their internship programs. The other thing I wanted to say is that we have our own careers manager, our very own um, faculty-specific careers manager full-time who helps our students um, seek op and seeks opportunities for our students and gives advice on, on how to apply for positions. She's fantastic. Amazing. So moving on from academic, uh, sorry, <laughs> career-related experiences um, and going back to academics, um, what are overseas electives and how can students get involved in those? Uh, there is a, there's a number of overseas electives um, and they they have in apart from just sort of applying from they have they have um, certain criteria so you have to have completed certain amount of credits and some of them might even have um, some other other merit base because they're often smaller and so you have to apply have to apply for these positions and they can be a bit competitive but yeah, no, there's quite a few. Have any, any of you done any of the electives? I just saw that one of my one of my colleagues just got back from the Vanuatu summer mm -hmm. summer elective. I was like, oh, that's tough. Well, maybe <laughs> I could teach. I could teach that one. I actually applied for one recently, and I just got accepted the other week. So, oh, fantastic! Hopefully, I will be going to Berkeley. Um, wow, yeah, excellent. so studying an elective over there at the end of this year. So wow. excited about that. Um, and speaking of electives, are there particularly any overseas electives that target international law or? Mm, I'm going to suggest that we, anyone who's interested in that would look to our handbook, our UNSW handbook, um, and just be typing into the search international electives, international law. That's not my area. Anyway, are you familiar with any of that? I'm not familiar directly with the overseas electives. Um, I am familiar there are two, there are three four I think now sorry there are four last time I checked of um, overseas competitions so they're the mediation yeah. and mooting competitions which will also send you overseas yes they just got back from Paris I know it looked oh. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know there is one international law elective um, that happens in New York um, I'm just not sure when it's running but hopefully it's running by the time you guys are here um, so moving on from that um, we were talking about readings a lot and we have a really great question about what actually are readings <laughs> and can we give any examples about them? Um, okay, yeah, so I guess readings are, uh, yeah, it's definitely very different to what you'd, you'd expect in school where you kind of get given homework and set tasks. Uh, readings are, um, I guess, preparation for each class you go into. So at the law school, most of, uh, at least all the core courses and most of the electives have two uh, classes per week. Um, and so for both of the, those classes, they'll be, either different, um, different kind of topics within that course or they'll be building onto each other. Um, and you will obviously have a textbook for that, for that uh, course, along with also um, some other articles that they may be pre prescribed to you. Um, and so you're given those to kind of read, take notes, uh, learn about those things. Um, there's no set questions or anything like that. It's very different to like tasks and homework, things like that. But it's very much, uh, I guess, your preparation for the class so you can come to class and exactly like, Helen has said before, participate and learn and discuss with your peers. Generally, yeah, most core courses would have a set text, a set textbook. Um, we would try and have sort of per hour of face-to-face -face two hours worth of reading. So for the two-hour class on a Monday or a Tuesday, you would have, um, have sort of four hours of expected 
um, preparation time, that's around about sort of 25 pages is we, is we might sort of aim for, depending on the, the size of the textbook or whatever. But my advice is don't think, oh, what if I don't have time? What if I don't understand everything? And that, that's what the seminars are for. Mm -hmm. So starting good habits early about reading, keeping your readings um, on top of your readings, but that doesn't mean reading word for word, reading every word and understanding it because you just simply don't have enough time. It's having a general sense of what the readings are about, having having a good idea of the sort of, and looking at, I find just looking at the headings, the subheadings, you're like, okay, I've now kind of got a plan in my head, understanding of what the readings this week are about, looking at the reading guide, this is the broader theme, mm -hmm. and then what are the key takeaways from the readings? And, and if there's something there, you say, I don't understand that, just write that down. I'm going to ask the teacher that because asking questions is just as important as answering questions. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really important that you do go into classes having tried or attempted to do your readings because that's when you know whether you are understanding something or not. And a lot of the times I will read a set of readings and have no idea what I'm talking about, no idea what we're going to discuss in class. But once you go into class, having even read some of the headings or read some of the chapters, you know kind of what area of mm. the readings will be discussed or what is going on generally. And then that knowledge, again, like you said, Helen, um, will be It'll all come to you in class, <laughs> if not afterwards as well. Um, so going on from that, um, how do trimesters work? And I'll pass it on to the students. What um, are the adv advantages of doing a trimester system over a semester system from your from your experience? You started with the semester, didn't you? Or yeah, so I did two years in semesters and then um, there was a transition to trimesters in my third year. So... Um, some of the advantages I've seen are the ability to only take two subjects a term. I found that's really good balancing with work and other commitments as well. Um, it does extend your degree a bit, but it's I've really enjoyed that. Um, I've also liked the fact that it lines up well with the over with the American and the European um, university systems which is good for exchange because it means you can do two terms at UNSW, um, you have a couple of weeks and then you can start um, at an overseas uni for exchange, which has been great for me, worked out really well. Yeah, um, I've, I've only ever done trimesters and then nothing else really. <laughs> um, but I think uh, definitely a lot of advantages. I have friends that go to other unis um, and I find that uh, to an extent the schedule is not as packed, your weekly schedule is not as packed because you're only doing maximum three subjects recommended. So yeah. you have a lot more time um, for other things during uh, your life. Um, but obviously there are more, I guess, contact weeks um, with the uni. Um, but I found that, yeah, I think it's really good for uh, allowing, you know, a balance and also you need to take a step back. If you want to even accelerate your degree, uh, you can take, obviously the recommended amount is eight eight subjects per year. Um, but if you, you have the opportunity to do nine, if you'd like, and then kind of, um, and if you, if you accelerate, you can also take a step back and maybe even take off a whole term and you won't be too far behind. So it's really flexible in that sense, yeah. Yeah, can I talk? Can yeah. I add on to that flexibility? I think that's really important. Um, as as you've said, the standard load is eight courses per year. That's what we expect. But if you wanted to s sort of speed up um, your program, you can take three per term, um, and so that would be nine over the year. But then in your other degrees, you could also, if you were really wanting to sort of get through it quickly, you could also add a fourth. Now, we don't recommend that because that's a huge load, but it de definitely is possible to create that flexibility so you don't fall behind. Okay, I might do my three standard courses, but then I might do one more and then I might get a whole term off. I might get ahead and, have a, and, and travel and um, and take up other opportunities. So there's an enormous amount of flexibility. Can I also say, having taught having taught under semesters and taught under trimesters, the advantage of tr other advantages of the trimesters is, as Matt said, you're only doing three courses. So under semesters, we did four, and that meant four exams. And I mean, when I came to here, when I came to law school here, it was four exams. Sometimes we'd even have five, um, which was really quite challenging um, and it felt like that expression that you use a, a marathon is a marathon and students by week 10 were exhausted academics were exhausted where now it's sort of more of a, a sprint and we get to week 10 and then there's a study period and then there the exam so it's it's quite a different feel it's quite a different style it's mm. it's definitely sort of it feels quicker yeah 
Mm. Um, but it's and it, but it's actually spread out. But it's the same amount of years. Like if you actually did the standard load, it's still you know five mm. years to depending on your double degree to six point seven years. Mm -hmm. um, but it gives it just gives you so much more flexibility. Yeah. Um, and also coming from high school, you're familiar with studying in terms. So when you come into university, it's also not a really big transition to be on for so long before you're off. Um, so yeah, that ten week. Um, does align with how you have been studying at school as well. Um, on the point of studying, what is the toughest um, or most challenging aspects of an under law, uh, undergrad law degree? Um, and do double degrees mean double the work? How do they work? I'll take it, I'll take it to you first, Jess. So, sorry, what was the first question? Um, the challenge, most challenging yeah, part? Most Great. Challenging part. Um, I would definitely say time management. It's really easy to get really in involved in your favourite subjects and um, maybe put n not so much attention on the others. But once you <laughs> find a system that works for you, um, I found that were certain times of the week, sort of times of the day that I like preferred reading so or studying. So that worked really well for me once I'd worked out that challenge. Um, and the second part of the question? So, um, sorry, I've completely forgotten. Do double degrees mean double the work? Um, so they don't mean double the work at the same time. So it's not like you're studying two full-time degrees at the same time. Um, it means that you do a mixture of courses that eventually over the five to 6.7 years gives you two degrees. So you might do like contracts, um, administrative law, and then a finance course, for example, or any other course you're studying, but it doesn't mean you're doing three commerce subjects and three law subjects at the same time. <laughs> so it's it's not. It makes sense when you when you start, but you're definitely not doing double full time work at the same time. And That's I think it's also good because you get to take some time away from one degree and do mm -hmm. another degree's work. Like I think for me personally. If I was doing a term where I have three law courses and that's a lot of reading, that's a lot of preparation, whereas if I do two law courses and one commerce course, I get that balance as well and I get to step away from one course that I'm not really getting my head around and move on to another and then come back. So I think, mm -hmm. honestly, I think it's so much better to do a law degree with another degree rather than just doing law on its own. But yeah, And that you get your... to meet people from two degrees and two different exactly. faculties as well, which yeah. is really lovely because then you end up with groups of friends from all over the university and you have access to all the opportunities that exist in the other faculty as well yeah. so just opens up a whole new world for you yeah best of both worlds um mm. i think obviously undergrad there's at unsw there you have to do another degree with mm. you you have to do a double degree with law and i think uh when i when i first looked at it when i was coming in i was like well what's the point of that but I, i've realized now that you know there's so many different skills that you learn on, on the other side that you really need to know um you know law doesn't stand on its own um, and yeah. neither does the world, you know, need to have, I guess, knowledge from everywhere. Um, but also if you do pursue uh, a lot of the double degrees, um, a single degree would have, uh, I guess, um, two years worth of like, uh, content and then they'd have a year of general study in, in a sense. So electives and things like that. Um, but if you do a double degree, most of them, um, I guess, kind of cut out that general study year and you just, uh, I guess you have one less year and you get yeah. two degrees, mm -hmm. I guess, for it. So it's like two for mm -hmm. the price of yeah. Not really two for the price of one, maybe yeah. two for the price of 1.75, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not double. If it was double the work, it would be six years. Yeah. Mm. But it's actually five. You actually get two two degrees with, with in five years, de depending on the degree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've also have some great um, questions about the application process and enrolment process. So um, is the application and enrolment process the same for mature age students? Um, yes, it is. And in terms of UAC preferences... Um, so when you're submitting your application on UAC, um, you would preference according to what you um, want to get into first. So like the way that UAC works is whatever your top preference is, you, you get your highest eligible preference. So say that you were eligible for a commerce degree at UNSW um, and you put commerce and then you also really want to get into law. So you do dual law as your second preference. Um, the criteria for dual law is higher than just a commerce degree at UNSW, so you should think about it strategically. So if you are going to get your first high, um, your highest eligible preference, you would get commerce, and then in the next round they would look at dual law. So if you are really wanting to get into law, you would put dual law over commerce, because if you don't get dual law, you're still going to get commerce. Um, so just think about that when you're um, choosing your preferences. 
Um, and going back to life at UNSW, so some students have asked about what the social life at UNSW is like. So maybe, Matt, I'll get you to answer, considering you can talk about our wonderful UNSW Law Society. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> so I guess starting with Law, law Society, there's, um, I guess Law Society works a lot, a lot hand in hand with the faculty. We try and offer as many opportunities as we can, career events, um, activities, well-being events, but also social events. Uh, we run um, flagship events every year, especially for first year students. We have our, our law camp. Um, where you get where I, I met a lot of my good friends now. Um, we also have our cruises and our and our annual ball. So lots of different opportunities with the Law Society, and it it just kind of adds to the overall feel. Uh, there's lots of different places where you can meet uh, lots of different people as well. But I think um, further than that uh, than the Law Society, uh, UNSW, as as um, everyone else has mentioned, the the vibe of it. Um, it's not just in the law school and not just in the Law Society. There's so many different opportunities that you can. You can have at, at UNSW. Um, personally, I've gotten involved with a lot of other clubs as well, the outside of law, and that's really gotten uh, given me the chance to meet a lot of different people who have very different perspectives, and, and that's why you come to university to challenge yourself. Um, and also the, uh, the organisation ARC that runs um, all the student life here at UNSW, I've had the opportunity to volunteer with them as well, um, especially for a lot of the, a lot of the on-campus life, um, especially like orientation week, um, even during um, the term, there's lots of different, uh, I guess, uh, places where you can go out and, and volunteer and meet new people and try and build a better community at UNSW. And I think that's why UNSW is so different to all the other unis. There's so many different people trying to build a better place. And that's why it works so well. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, on that, um, we also have a question about, do we do mock trials? So we don't specifically do mock trials, but there's a lot of competitions available to students and I'll get you guys to talk about some of them. So we have um, competitions that the UNSW Law Society runs, but we also have competitions that the faculty is in charge of. And um, as Jess was speaking about before, some of those um, do give you an opportunity to go overseas or go into state to participate in them. So um, Jess, did you want to speak about those? Yeah, of course. I think you've covered most of it. But um, so at law at the at the law school and through the law society there are a number of different competitions and different just stacks of different things you can be involved in that are related to the law um so it's not specifically mock trial but it's things like mooting which is um where you prepare a case and you essentially act the role of a barrister in the court um there's negotiations which is um a mediation start which is a mediation that you participate in there's witness examination um and I'm sure I'm client interviewing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and so the way that that works, if you'd like to get involved, is there's different there's different levels. So there's beginners, there's intermediate and advanced. So they're specifically designed for you to get involved from your first year. So you're not going to be up against people who've almost completed their degree. They're designed in a way that it's accessible and it's really encouraged that you participate. And it's really fun. It's really relaxed. It's a great way to meet people as well. Mm -hmm. So that's how it works through the Law Society. Um, and then separate to that, there's faculty there's faculty moots and negotiations. So they're the ones that uh, run for course credit and they're some of the ones that allow you to go overseas. Yeah, awesome. Um, so just to wrap up before we leave, um, we'd like to leave students with one piece of advice. So I'll start with you, Helen. What's one piece of advice that you would um, give to potential law students or students looking to apply into university? Um, just building on the conversation we've just been having, really see coming to law school as not just, you're just not here to learn about the law, you're not here to just acquire the knowledge. Coming off a few years of online teaching from COVID, that just became, we already knew it, but it just became so obvious where classes were really just about, and the law school sort of became just about learning law. Um, it's what you have been talking about that the university provides, the law school provides, that is just as important as the content that we teach you and the knowledge that you are, um, acquire while you're here. Because law is it's very much a personal um, journey and you will be involved, you'll meet so many different people and it's really important that you start to build solid solid relationships from as soon as you get here because they will be the lawyers that you'll be type saying, mm -hmm. you know, I've got this legal issue, can you give me some advice? You'll still know them when when you're in your in a nursing home. Um, <laughs> I, I cannot emphasize enough that there's the content and then there's 
the university life and it's this is that's it's just as important and in, and having a good set of um, friends from early on to to sort of rely on um, I would say get building off your point Helen um, just get involved really yeah. early so I've made some of my closest friends in university <clears throat> excuse me um, yeah. I've made some of my closest friends and that was mostly um, through class yeah. who've been there they're quite small classes. It's really easy to meet people, yeah, it's really easy. but also through everything else. So, like when you're when you're doing things with people, you end up spending a lot of time with them, and they're really everyone I've met has been really lovely. So, it's a great, it's just a great place to be. Yeah, yeah. I think we're all along the same kind of thread, but get involved, and um, I guess don't ever squander the opportunities that you're given. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. and that's not just it in your studies, you know, take every opportunity to maximize your studies because it'll help. Obviously, why else are you here? Obviously, <laughs> other reasons, but learning um socially take every opportunity to meet as many people as you can um and get involved in things that mean something to you really discover who you are here um and outside of university even you know being a university student doesn't mean you spend all your time at university you go out there and get involved in things that ma matter to you and, and meet people from every different walk of life um and, and yeah just get involved take every opportunity yeah exactly just echoing everything that's been said um, the one thing that I live by, and I I was taught this when I was in year 12 by someone who did um, a speech at our school, is that input equals output. So in every aspect of your life, whether it be now going into the HSC or it be once you're in university, input does equal output. So whatever you put into your subjects, whatever you put into your university opportunities um, is what you'll take from them. So just really think about that as you're doing your HSC and as you're um, entering into university and looking at all of the amazing opportunities around you. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to our wonderful panellists. Um, um, we have really enjoyed speaking to you and uh, I've also learned a few things along the way, so it's been great. I'll take those in with me as I finish the rest of my degree. Um, and if you have any questions that have been unanswered, you are more than welcome to send um, an inquiry to our lovely future students advisors and they'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you.